In this video, we're going to look at so-called subjective or Bayesian interpretations of the probability concept. By the end, you should have a better idea what this approach is all about and why many people find it an attractive framework for thinking about probabilities. In the previous video, we looked at relative frequency interpretations of probability. On this view, when we say that the probability of a fair coin landing heads is one half, what we're really saying is that if you were to toss the coin repeatedly, in the long run, half the tosses would land heads. And the probability is just identified with the long run relative frequency behavior of the coin. But there are lots of cases where the relative frequency interpretation just doesn't make intuitive sense of how we're using a probability concept. For example, let's say I'm at work and I remember that I left the back door of my house unlocked and I'm worried about the house being robbed because there have been a rash of robberies in my area over the past two weeks. So I'm driving home from work and I'm asking myself, what are the odds that when I get home, I'll discover that my house has been robbed? This is an example of a single case probability. I'm not interested in any kind of long run frequency behavior. I'm interested in the odds of my house being robbed on this specific day, on this one single occasion. Examples like this are very hard for frequency approaches to analyze. The more natural way to think of it is this. I have a certain degree of belief in whether this event occurred. If someone asks me how likely it is that I've been robbed today, and I say, I think there's at least a 10% chance I was robbed, what I'm doing is reporting on the strength of my subjective degree of confidence in this outcome. What I'm reporting on is a subjective attitude I have toward the belief that I've been robbed. If my degree of belief is very low, that's a low probability. If it's moderate, that's a moderate probability. If it's high, that's a high probability. This is what it means to say that probability is subjective. What you're saying is that what probabilities represent are not features of the external world, but rather features of your personal subjective mental states, namely your degree of belief that a given event will occur or that a given statement is true. Subjectivists about probability want to generalize this idea and say that probability in general should be interpreted as a measure of degree of belief. This conceptual framework can be applied even to cases where the frequency and interpretation also works. If we're talking about the probability of a coin landing heads being equal to one half, the subjectivist will interpret this as saying that you're 50% confident in your belief that the coin will land heads. Okay, at this point, there's an obvious objection to interpreting probability in this way. The objection is this. People are notoriously bad at reasoning with probabilities. Our degrees of belief routinely violate the basic mathematical rules for reasoning with probabilities. If probabilities are interpreted as mere subjective degrees of belief, then in what sense can we possibly have a theory of probability, a theory that distinguishes good reasoning from bad reasoning? Subjectivists, or Bayesians as they're often called, have an answer to this question. They argue that the only logically consistent way of reasoning with subjective degrees of belief is if those degrees of belief satisfy the basic mathematical rules of reasoning with probabilities. All the action in the subjective interpretation lies in the details of this argument. So what I'm going to give here is just a rough sketch of the reasoning, which I'll break down into three steps. Okay, first, one of the challenges of reasoning with subjective probabilities is that because they're a feature of our inner mental states, they're hard to access. We need some way of assigning a number to represent a degree of belief. How do we do this? In the early part of the 20th century, Frank Ramsey and Bruno Di Finetti independently came up with the basic solution, which exploits the fact that there is a close relationship between belief and action, and in this case, between degrees of belief and one's betting behavior when one is asked to choose between different bets or gambles or lotteries. I'm going to use a visual device to help illustrate the idea. Let's say I want to measure the strength of your belief that this coin will end heads on the next toss. I know we know the probability in this case, it's 50%. But let's just use this case to illustrate the procedure. Then we can use an example that isn't so obvious. Okay, we imagine that we're faced with a choice to select between two different bets. Bet number one. The bet is whether you think it's true or not that the coin will land heads. If it lands heads, you win $1,000. If it lands tails, you win nothing. Bet number two. The bet is whether you should play a lottery. Where the lottery has 1,000 tickets, and in this lottery, there are 250 winning tickets. If you draw a winning ticket, you win $1,000. If you don't draw a winning ticket, you win nothing. So the question is, which bet would you prefer to take? Bet one or bet two? 
well, this is easy. We're all going to pick bet one, right? Because we think the odds of the coin landing heads are higher than the odds of winning the lottery, which is only 25%. We believe that we're more likely to win bet one than bet two. Now, imagine that bet two was different. Imagine that the lottery in bet two has 750 winning tickets. So you win if you draw any of those 750 winning tickets. Now, which bet would you pick? Well, this time we'd all pick bet two because now the odds of winning the lottery is 75%. So we're more confident that we'd win this bet than bet one. So what we've established here by examining your preferences between different bets is that your degree of confidence that the coin will end heads lies somewhere between 0.25 and 0.75. Now we can narrow this range by selecting different bets with different numbers of winning lottery tickets. Now what will happen if we're offered a lottery with exactly 500 winning tickets? In this case, we should be indifferent between these two bets, since we think the odds of winning the $1,000 are the same in both cases. We shouldn't prefer one bet over the other. And this is the behavioral fact that fixes your degree of belief in the proposition at hand. When you're indifferent between these two choices, the percentage of winning tickets in the lottery can function as a numerical measure of the strength of your belief in the proposition that you're betting on in bet one. We can use this imaginary procedure to measure the strength of your belief in any proposition, like my belief that when I get home I'll discover that my house was robbed. If I end up being indifferent between a bet that my house was robbed and a bet that I'll win the lottery with, say, 100 winning tickets, then we can say that I'm about 10% confident that my house was robbed. Now, if you ever find yourself reading the subject of probability literature, the more common language you'll encounter is the language of betting ratios and betting rates. But the main idea is the same. The procedure I'm describing here using lotteries is more commonly used in decision theory, but it's inspired by the same body of work by Ramsey and DeFinetti. Let's move on to step two. So we now have a way of representing our personal degrees of belief by betting rates on imaginary gambles. This gives us an operational procedure for assigning a real number to a degree of belief. But we still don't have any rules for how to reason with these degrees of belief. The next step in the subjectivist program is to show that a rational betting strategy will automatically satisfy the basic mathematical rules for reasoning with probabilities. Now in this context, all we mean by a rational betting strategy is this. No rational person will willingly agree to a bet that is guaranteed to lose them money. A bet that is guaranteed to lose you money is called a sure loss contract. If someone's personal degrees of belief are open to a sure loss contract, then that person can become what's called a money pump. A bookmaker could exploit this knowledge to sell you betting contracts that you will accept, but you will never win. You'll always lose money. Not a good thing. These sure loss contracts are also known as Dutch book contracts. And this kind of argument is called a Dutch book argument. Ramsey was the one who introduced this language, but I don't know why he called it a, a Dutch book. I'm not sure what being Dutch has to do with it. But the term Dutch book is now standard in probability theory and economics. I'm going to follow Ian Hacking and just call it a sure loss contract. So we can now define an important concept. If a set of personal degrees of belief is not open to a sure loss contract, then the set of beliefs is called coherent. In other words, if your set of beliefs is coherent, then by definition you can't be turned into a money pump for an unscrupulous bookie. Note that this is a technical sense of coherence specific to this context. It's intended as an extension of the logical concept of consistency applied to partial degrees of belief. Now, the main theoretical result that Ramsey and DeFinetti developed was this. A set of personal degrees of belief is coherent if and only if the set satisfies the basic rules of probability theory. And here we're just talking about the standard mathematical rules. The details of this theorem aren't important. What's important is what it represents for the subjectivist program. Our original concern, remember, was that personal degrees of belief are unconstrained. They don't have to follow any rules. What Ramsey and DeFinetti and others have shown is that if one adopts this very pragmatic and self-interested concept of rationality, namely that a rational person won't willingly adopt a set of subjective degrees of belief that is guaranteed to lose them money, then it follows that this person's belief set will satisfy all the basic rules of probability theory. So it's in this sense that the subjective approach to probability brings with it a normative theory of probability. Let's move on now to step three. In the literature, people who work within the subjective framework I'm describing here are often called Bayesians. 
And this approach is called Bayesianism. So let's say a few words about this language. Bayes' rule can be derived from the basic mathematical rules of probability. It's basically just a way of calculating conditional probabilities given certain information. Here's the simplest form of Bayes' rule. H and E can stand for any two propositions, but in practice we often use Bayes' rule to evaluate how strongly a bit of evidence supports a hypothesis. So let H be some hypothesis, let E be some bit of evidence. Maybe H is the hypothesis that a patient has the HIV virus, and E is a positive blood test for the virus. We read this term as the probability that H is true given that E is true. On the subjectivist reading, this is the degree of belief that we should have in hypothesis H once we've learned about the evidence E. This is also called the posterior probability of the hypothesis. P of H all by itself is called the prior probability of the hypothesis. This is the degree of belief we had in H before ever learning about the new evidence E. In our example, this would be the probability that the patient has HIV before learning the results of the blood test. P of E given H is called the likelihood of the evidence given the hypothesis. This is how likely it is that we would observe evidence E if the hypothesis H was in fact true. So in our example, this is the probability that someone will test positive for the HIV virus given that they actually have the virus. For a very reliable test, this might be like 95% or something. Now the term in the denominator is called the total probability of the evidence E. In our example, this term is going to represent the probability of testing positive for the HIV virus, whether or not the patient actually has the virus. So this term will also depend on information about the false positive rate for the test, the percentage of times a patient will test positive even when they don't have the virus. I'm not going to spend any more time explaining how this calculation will go right here, because it's not vital to the point I'm making. And I've got a whole other course on the rules of probability theory that explains these kinds of calculations in more detail. The point I want to make here is that when you interpret probabilities the way that subjectivists do, Bayes' rule gives us a model for how we ought to learn from experience, how we ought to update our degrees of belief in a hypothesis in light of new evidence. Bayes' rule has lots of important applications in statistical inference theory, but in the hands of subjectivists, it also functions as the central principle of a theory of rational belief formation and rational inference. This is why subjectivists are often called Bayesians. It's because within this interpretation, Bayes' rule takes on great importance as part of a general theory of rationality. For frequency theorists, Bayes' rule is just another useful formulation of conditional probability, and its use is restricted to cases where relative frequencies can be defined. For subjectivists, it's fundamental to their whole approach to rationality, and it can be used in a much wider range of applications, since they're not restricted to applications using relative frequencies. There's also a whole field of philosophical work that you could describe as falling under the label of Bayesian epistemology, which applies Bayesian principles to various problems in the philosophy of knowledge, philosophy of science, and decision theory, and learning theory, and so forth. Regardless of what you think of it, this approach to probability has had a huge impact on philosophy and science. Okay, here's a summary of what we've been talking about. Step one in the Bayesian program is to find a way of numerically representing a person's degree of belief. We use betting rates to do this. Once you've got this, we can talk about rational and irrational betting strategies. In step two, we show that if our degrees of belief are coherent, then they'll automatically satisfy the basic mathematical rules of probability theory. And step three involves the use of Bayes' rule as a guide for how we ought to update our beliefs based on evidence. Now, we've been looking at objections to all the previous interpretations of probability that, that we've covered, so it's only fair to mention that, of course, there are objections to the kind of subjective Bayesianism that I've been describing here. The best I can do here is just briefly describe a few, since it would take too long to try to explain them all in detail. But here we go. First objection. Bayesianism assumes logical omniscience. The claim is that if our beliefs satisfy the basic rules of probability, then the rules require that all beliefs about logical truths have probability 1, and beliefs about logical contradictions have probability 0. So on this view, if our beliefs are coherent, then we can never believe a contradiction. The objection is that this is just false of human beings. None of us are logically omniscient in this way, and so it's an unreasonable standard to impose on our beliefs. Second objection. Bayesianism assumes that classical logic is the only logic. This follows from the bit about logical omniscience. 
I've never talked about non-classical logics before in my tutorials, but there are such things. Logical theories that use different fundamental rules of inference from standard classical logic. We've largely moved away from the days when everyone thought that classical logic was the only possible logic one could use. So the objection is that Bayesianism presupposes that the rules of classical logic are correct and make them immune to revision based on empirical evidence. So consequently, it grants them a kind of a priori status that few people actually think it has anymore. Third objection, the problem of old evidence. From Bayes' rule, it follows that if the probability of a piece of evidence is 1, then the likelihood of the evidence given some hypothesis is also 1. But if this is so, then such evidence can never raise the probability of a hypothesis. The posterior probability will always be just the same as the prior probability. Now, this poses a problem for Bayesian views on how so-called old evidence might support a new scientific theory. For example, Newton's theory of gravity doesn't completely predict the orbit of Mercury. It doesn't adequately account for the precession of Mercury's orbit around the Sun. This behavior of Mercury's orbit was known in the mid-19th century. Sixty years later, Einstein comes up with the general theory of relativity, and his new theory accurately predicts this piece of old evidence, the precession of Mercury's orbit. Now, the objection is that this is rightly viewed as an empirical success of Einstein's theory. It should lend support to his theory. But the Bayesian has a hard time explaining how this old evidence can give us additional reason to believe the theory. Okay, fourth objection, the problem of new theories. It seems intuitive that sometimes the invention of a new theory all by itself can influence our confidence in an old theory, especially when the old theory didn't have any rivals. So imagine the old Earth-centered cosmology of Ptolemy, where all the heavenly bodies move around a motionless Earth. This theory had no competition for a long time. Then along comes Copernicus with this sun-centered cosmology that can explain everything that Ptolemy's theory did. Now, wouldn't this fact alone lead some people to reasonably reconsider their support for Ptolemy's theory, to lower their conviction in the truth of this theory? And the objection to Bayesianism is that it's not clear how this kind of shift in support can be explained or justified in the Bayesian framework. Okay, fifth objection. Additional constraints on prior probabilities are needed. This is sometimes just called the problem of the priors. The issue is this. What we're calling subjective Bayesianism doesn't place any restrictions on the values of the prior probabilities beyond the requirement of coherence. In other words, it doesn't constrain your beliefs beyond the requirement that they be consistent with the rules of probability. And when you learn new evidence, you update your beliefs according to Bayes' rule. The objection is that this is just way too permissive you can have literally crazy views of the world that would be permitted by these rules. Within those belief sets, you'd be updating your beliefs rationally when you encountered new evidence, but the belief sets themselves would be wildly different. So, different constraints on prior probabilities have been proposed. One proposal, for example, is that subjective degrees of belief should, at the very least, track the relative frequencies that are known. So, for example, if it's known that a baseball player is hitting 350 this season, then all other things being equal, it seems reasonable to assign a degree of belief of 0.35, or 35%, as the prior probability that he'll get a hit the next time at bat. Now, if you're a Bayesian, and you think along these lines, then you're not a strict subjective Bayesian. You're drifting more in the direction of what's called an objective Bayesian. Because you think there are objective features of the world, like relative frequencies, that should restrict the probabilities you assign to your beliefs. What we end up with here is really a family of Bayesian approaches to probability that range from more subjective to more objective varieties. And where you fall in this range depends on how many and what sorts of additional constraints you're willing to place on the prior probabilities. Okay, I think that's more than enough for this introduction to subjective probability. There are other objections, of course, but these are some of the main ones. So to wrap things up, I'll just conclude with this. There are a lot of smart people working today in philosophy, statistics, applied math and science, computer science, artificial intelligence, and so on, who are engaged in research within what can be described as a broadly Bayesian framework. That doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of open problems with the framework that need to be solved. But it does mean that this is a framework that people are willing to openly endorse without embarrassment.